Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cut Rate Commander, the series where we take a look at low price commanders and make budget decks with them. My name is Grazit, and today we'll be looking at a build featuring the life-gaining board wipe on a body, Amalia Benavides Aguirre, and her reanimating companion, Luris of the Dream Den. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content, and if you really like it, please consider supporting the channel directly, either through Buy Me A Coffee, or through our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see which commanders we'll be covering next, and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and playstyle. Amalia Benavides Aguirre is a 2-2 vampire scout with ward pay 3 life that costs Sorzov and has the following ability. Whenever we gain life, she explores. Then, if her power is exactly 20, destroy all other creatures. Then her companion, Loris of the Dream Den, is a 3-2 nightmare cat with lifelink that costs 1 and 2 hybrid Orzov that, in order to be our companion, needs to have our deck contain only CMC 2 or less permanents, and has the following ability. During our turn, we may cast one permanent spell of CMC 2 or less from our graveyard. Breaking down our commander's core stats first, Amalia is sporting a low to the ground CMC, an average stat block for her cost, and a life gain payoff ability that helps us draw lands, set up our bin, empower our commander, and, eventually, clear the board. Taking a closer look at this ability, at base, it serves as a decent incremental life gain payoff whose repeatable explorer provides us with added consistency via drawing us lands to ensure we make our land drops, while also making our commander bigger as we hit non-lands to turn her into a legitimate commander damage dealing threat, all while building up to a wipe that clears away any blockers that could have stopped our, by then, 2020 plus commander from one-shotting our opponents which Amalia can build up to quite quickly thanks to our color's easy access to sources of repeatable life gain. That said, the fact that Explore can be used to load up our bin with cards shouldn't be overlooked, as Orzov has plenty of single target and mass reanimation effects at its disposal to make use of those cards while Amalia digs for land drops. Cards like our companion, Luris, who allows us to cast a permanent spell from our bin once per rotation. Now, admittedly, she does pigeonhole us into running only CMC 2 or less permanents if we want to run her as a companion, but A, many of the cards that provide passive and repeatable life gain to enable Amalia fall within this category anyway, and B, we can still run higher CMC instants and sorceries so we aren't entirely locked out of higher CMC spells, making her a rather nice inclusion to work in tandem alongside our commander to effectively turn our graveyard into a second second hand. So, as we can see with our commander and companion pairing, Amalia and Aluris combine to make an interesting life gain and reanimation focused team, with the former turning all our life gain into pseudo card advantage and graveyard setup while she makes herself bigger, and the latter turning that graveyard setup into actual value via the repeatable reanimation she provides. And, luckily for us, life gain and reanimation are the two categories that our colors excel at giving us access to plenty of incremental and repeatable sources of life gain as creatures enter and leave play to proc Amalia's explore as often as possible, as well as a solid selection of reanimation effects to work in conjunction with Loris to bring even more of our low CMC creatures from our bin back into play. Then, to ensure that our commander and companion pair stick around for as long as possible so we can get the maximum usage out of their effects, we'll be running a suite of creatures alongside them whose sole purpose is to keep them alive by sacking themselves away, which pull double duty in this build by both being recurrable by Luris so we can get extra uses out of them, as well as reliably proccing our on-death sources of life gain so we don't have to run traditional sack outlets to do so, enabling Amalia and Luris to more easily combine their efforts and chart a course for victory. So let us make our way to Exelon, where Amalia stands before an omen path, an extra planar portal created as a result of the Phyrexian invasion. As she stands before it, a sparkling circle floating above the ground, large enough for a human to walk through, she recalled what had brought her to this point. 
The revelation that the god she worshipped, Aklozots, was not the benevolent deity she thought him to be, but a cruel and bloodthirsty one who wished to drag their world into another war, the ultimate sacrifice her friend Bartolome had made for her so she and Kellen could escape the power-mad Vito, and even her conflicting nature as a vampire who abhorred violence and cruelty, making her soft in the eyes of her peers. It was clear that there was nothing left for her on Ixalan, only bitter memories, and before her lay a chance at adventure far beyond the world she would leave behind. So, with Kellen at her side, she stepped through the shimmering portal and vanished. And maybe, just maybe, she would find herself transported deep into Ikoria's Indatha lowlands, where a certain den mother makes a home for her kittens. But who can really say? So, now that we know a bit more about our commander and companion pair and their playstyle, let's start taking a look at the deck itself by starting with the creatures. Opening with what is undoubtedly the most important portion of our build, our life gain package, we'll start off with a suite of creatures that will allow us to generate life as often as possible, so we can then in turn generate as much value off of Amalia's Explore as we can. As such, we'll begin with some life-gaining entrants that gain us life as other creatures come into play, such as Soul Warden, Soul's Attendant, and Auroch Champion, all of which gain us life whenever any creature comes into play outside of themselves, which not only allows us to trigger Amalia's Explore more frequently since it will proc on our opponent's turns, but also opens the possibility of proccing her board wipe on their turns as well, making it even more disruptive. The Legends Daxos, Blessed by the Sun, and Ellis Elcor Sadistic Pilgrim, both of whose life gain only procs as our creature's ETB, but are also on death payoffs to make up for it, gaining us more life as our creatures die in the former's case and burning our opponent's life in the latter's. Suture Priest, which serves as another source of life gain as our creatures come down while also burning our opponents as they bring down theirs. And lastly, Lunark Veteran, Impassioned Orator, and Distinguished Conjurer, which again provide us with even more ETB-focused life gain as our creatures come down, and can even bring some additional utility to the table, such as being able to reanimate itself as an on-death source of life gain in the first case, or being able to flicker our creatures to dodge removal and reproc its and all our other ETB life gain sources in the lasts. Then, on the flip side of the equation, we'll also be running some creatures that gain us life as bodies leave the battlefield, which may not happen as often, but are still excellent to have as creatures naturally die off or we sack them away for effects, like Death Breeder, which gains us life whenever any creature dies to again proc our commander outside of our turn, Blood Artist, which instead drains life from an opponent when any creature dies to both trigger Amalia and whittle down our opponent's life totals, and Azulaport Cutthroat and Cruel Celebrant, both of which only care about our creatures dying but are sources of AoE life drain to compensate, softening up the entire table as our creatures hit the bin while fueling our primary game plan and then pivoting away from sources of life gain focused around creatures entering and leaving the battlefield and onto some more unique sources of it. We'll be adding in Thrall Parasite, Basilica Screecher, and a Tithe Drinker to our ranks, whose extort allows us to pay additional mana to turn any of our spells into AoE life drain, potentially multiple times if we have more than one in play, and the first even serving as a way to get counters off of Amalia if we want to delay or reproc her board wipe, Spectrum Sentinel, which gains us life whenever an opponent plays a non-basic land, an event that will be happening very often in a game of Commander to keep the life gain flowing outside of our turns, and Archivist of Ogma, which gains us life and draws us a card whenever an opponent searches their deck, making it a superb source of repeatable life gain and card advantage against green decks and their land ramp sources, as well as against builds that like to run tutors. And lastly, as our only other proper source of life gain in our creature slot, we have the legend Ailey Eternal Pilgrim, whose cheap instant speed way to turn our creatures into life gain is nice to have in response to removal and wipes if we can't save that creature and or to proc our on death payoffs, while her repeatable exile based removal is superb at dealing with even resilient threats, and we should usually have no issue meeting its 10 over starting life total activation requirement considering how much life gain we're running. Now, with our life-gaining creatures covered, let's move on to some of the self-sacking creatures we'll be running to both help proc our on-death sources of life-gain, and to ensure Amalia and Luris stay in play for as long as possible. 
such as Selfless Savior, Selfless Samurai, and Selfless Spirit, all of which can grant indestructibility to either a single creature or all of our creatures, making them all excellent at protecting our commander and companion pair against most conventional removal and wipes, and the latter even protecting our entire board from Amalia's own wipe if the opportunity presents itself, Dauntless Bodyguard and Allenbach Escort, both of which can also make a creature indestructible but are a bit more limited in scope, with the former requiring the targeted protects to be picked when it comes down, and the latter only protecting creatures with plus one plus one counters on them, but are still worth running since we can generally work around these conditions to make use of the manaless protection they provide. Vigilant Martyr, which regenerates a creature and can occasionally be used to counter enchantment spells, which is admittedly weird but nice to have access to. And to close out this slot, Alseed of Life's Bounty and Benevolent Bodyguard, both of which provide protection against the specific color, which admittedly doesn't do much against wipes, but still protects against targeted removal and can also be used to make Amalia evasive against the color of our choice, allowing her to get in for commander damage more reliably even if she doesn't blow up the board. Then moving on to self-sacking creatures that we'll be using to disrupt our opponent's boards rather than protecting our own, we have Cathar Commando, which we can use as a surprise 3-1 blocker thanks to Flash, or as a means to pop our opponent's back row instead for one mana more depending on what we need, and Banalish Sleeper, which if we pay its kicker cost, becomes an AoE Edict we can always recast from the bin with Luris to pick apart our opponent's boards turn after turn. And then to close out our selection of self-sacking creatures, we have Priest of Fell Rites, which earns a spot in this build by being a slow but mannerless way to reanimate any creature back from our bin, making it a fantastic way to get back Luris if she's destroyed, who can then in turn bring it back to be used again. And finally, reaching the tail end of our creature base, we'll be adding some generic creatures that we'll be using to help pad our core stats, starting with some ramp sources in the form of Knight of the White Orchid and Loyal Warhound, both of which give us some rare access to land-based ramp in our colors to help us keep up with green decks, and that we can reanimate with Luris if they're destroyed or sacked to get us even more ramp, Scholar of New Horizons, which can turn the counters Amalia accrues into more land ramp or land tutoring for even more mana acceleration, and to slow down or repeat her board wipe, and Lotho Corrupt Sheriff, who instead generates us treasure whenever any player casts their second spell per turn, easily allowing us to amass multiple treasures per rotation to help speed up and fix our mana base. And lastly, we'll be running Hopeful Initiate as another way to remove counters from Amalia to repeatedly pop our opponent's back row at instant speed, as well as Triarch Praetorian, whose ability to draw us cards when it ETBs from the bin pairs fantastically with Luris to net us repeatable card advantage, while proccing all our ETB life gain sources in the process. That covers all our creatures, so let's move on to our instance. Starting off with the only two sources of self-sacking we'll be running in this category, we have Corrupted Conviction and Village Rights, which we'll be using in this build as simple and cheap sources of card advantage that we can use in response to removal, to proc our on-death payoffs, and to set up Loris's reanimation, and often, all three. Then, for the remainder of this category, it's going to be removal all the way down, in which we'll of course be slotting in Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares, which serve as superb sources of dirt cheap exile-based removal to efficiently deal with most creature-based threats, as well as Generous Gift and Stroke of Midnight, whose increased cost is justified by their flexibility, as they easily allow us to deal with almost any type of permanent threat our opponents can throw our way. That covers all our instants, so let's move on to our sorceries. Entering our sorcery category, we'll be focusing most of our efforts here on ways to reanimate our creatures alongside Luris, so we can make the most use out of the graveyard setup Amalia's repeated explorers provide. With spells such as Ascend from Avernus and Immortal Servitude, both of which provide us with mass reanimation to return most, if not all, our creatures back into play, making them a fantastic way to build up our board after multiple explorers or to rebuild our board after a wipe, Call of the Death Dweller and Patch Up, 
each of which can reanimate us multiple bodies that add up to CMC3, with the former being limited to two but getting some decent keyword counters on them to make up for it, while the latter can hit any number, and, rather importantly, both allowing us to bring back Luris if we need to, Savine's Reclamation, which we can play from our hand and from our bin thanks to Flashback to get extra uses out of it, or we can simply send it to the bin with Explore since we can always use it from there later, and Unearth, which is a dirt cheap source of reanimation that hits our entire creature base, and gives us the flexibility to cantrip it if we need to instead. And then as our last reanimation source in this category, we have Finale of Eternity, which admittedly doesn't become a reanimation spell until we have 12 mana, but can be used as scalable removal on up to 3 creatures before that, preventing it from becoming a dead card by functioning as a piece of decent spot removal early, and, if we can get there, removal and a backbreaking mass reanimation spell later. And then to wrap up our sorceries, we'll be running a pair of board wipes in the form of Dam and Austere Command, both of which allow us to retake control of the board while giving us some additional flexibility, the former allowing us to cast it as single target removal instead if we just need to deal with one creature rather than blowing up the board, while the latter can be customized to deal with almost any type of board imaginable, allowing us to dodge most of our board while maximizing the damage we can inflict on our opponents for maximum disruption. That covers all our sorceries, so let's move on to our enchantments. Jumping straight into more life gain sources as we enter our enchantment category, we'll be slotting in a Johnny's Welcome, which provides our build with yet another cheap source of ETB life gain for our creatures, this time from the relative safety of our back row, Blind Obedience, which gives us access to another source of extort, so we can continue draining the life out of our opponents as we cast our spells, as well as slowing them down considerably by having their artifacts and creatures come into play tapped to give us more time to do so, and Vampiric Rites, which serves as a repeatable sack outlet that gains us life and draws us cards while giving Luris targets to reanimate as it does so. Then, as a pair of life gain payoffs to take advantage of our primary game plan, we'll also be adding in Cleric Class, which initially boosts the effectiveness of all our life gain sources, and later we can pump mana into in order to turn that life gain into additional plus one plus one counters to grow Amalia even faster, and to provide us with some emergency reanimation if needed, alongside Dawn of Hope, which instead lets us repeatedly turn our life gain into card advantage, and, if we find ourselves low on bodies, we can also use it to create life-linking tokens to build up our board and proc all our ETB sources of life gain in the process. And lastly, we'll be adding some additional core stat-improving enchantments in the form of Call of the Ring and Dawn of a New Age, each of which provide us with passive card advantage so we can replenish our resources at no mana cost, while also providing some additional utility in either the form of tempting us with the ring in the former's case, or by gaining us some life once it's used up in the latter's, and Retribution of the Ancients, which gives us yet another way to turn the counters on our commander into removal, this time non-destruction, to let us deal with threats without having to resort to leveling the board entirely. That covers all our enchantments, so let's move on to our artifacts. Reaching our artifacts, we'll find that this category will consist entirely of core stat improving entries that will either help replenish our resources or speed up our mana base, with the former camp consisting of our lone draw focused artifact, Skull Clamp, which can make great use out of our multitude of X1 creatures to cheaply and repeatedly generate us card advantage, while also procking our on death payoffs and giving Loris additional bodies to reanimate. And then in the latter camp, we'll be running the Mana Rocks Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, Orzhov Signet, Talisman of Hierarchy, and Mindstone, as well as the Land Ramp Source Wayfarer's Bobble as means to efficiently speed up and fix our mana base, with the last two sack effects also making them recastable off of Lurist and add us some additional draw or land ramp if we need it. That covers all our artifacts, so let's move on to our land base. Quickly going over our mana lands, we'll be running Command Tower, Caves of Koilos, Isolated Chapel, Shine Shadow Snarl, and a Tainted Field, as lands that tap for both our colors that either always or usually come into play untapped to give us easy access to our colors without sacrificing speed in the process, 
Sunlit Martian scoured barons as tapped duels that make up for their slow speed by either possessing basic land types or by proccing our commander with the life gain they provide. And Obscura Storefront has a slow fetch that also provides life gain when we use it to provide us with even more fixing while playing into our primary game plan. Then for utility lands, we'll of course be running Bajuga Bog as a source of reliable graveyard hate to help us combat against graveyard-focused builds, Restless Fortress as a man land that we can pump mana into to drain the life from the defending player as we swing in with it, making it decent at proccing our commander and other life gain payoffs while still tapping for both our colors, Vault of the Archangel as a way to turn our large number of small creatures into death-touching lifelinkers, making blocking them very difficult unless our opponents are willing to take heavy losses while we reanimate any creature we lose, and Rogue's Passage making it in as a way to make Amalia evasive so she can reliably get in for commander damage, or alternatively, make Lurus evasive so she can gain us life via her lifelink to proc Amalia instead. And finally, we'll be running 12 planes and 9 swamps as our basics to close out our land base. So, now that we've covered all the cards in the deck, let's take a look at this deck's breakdown. This deck currently has 38 creatures including our commander and companion pairing, 6 instants, 9 sorceries, 8 enchantments, 7 artifacts, 0 planeswalkers, and 33 lands. Looking at the stats that matter to our game plan, we have 32 sources of life gain, 10 of which occur when creatures enter play, and 5 of which occur when creatures die off, 13 permanents that can sack themselves to activate their effects, 4 additional sack effects and sack outlets, 10 sources of reanimation, and 8 cards that can protect our creatures from targeting and or destruction. Leaving us with a final build with plenty of ways to enable Amalia and Luris via the life gain it generates as our creatures enter and leave play, the various ways we can get our creatures into the bin to be reanimated, and even the suite of protection effects we'll be running to ensure both our commander and our companion stay in play for as long as possible so we can get the maximum mileage out of their effects. For general deck stats, we have 10 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 12 targeted removal sources, and 3 board wipes, giving us a fairly typical array of core stats. Then looking at our mana curve, we have 25 1 drops, 33 2 drops, 8 3 drops, and 1 6 drop, leaving us with a hyper aggressive mana curve that aims to drop at least one source of repeatable life gain early, followed by our commander to get our explorer engine started. Then from there, we should be aiming to use Amalia's Explorer to dig as aggressively as we can, sending anything we can reanimate with Luris to the bin to help us hit more lands to draw or more reanimation spells to leave on the top, followed by getting Luris into play alongside creatures we can sack away to protect both her and Amalia, allowing us to accrue more and more counters on Amalia until her board wipe triggers, leveling our opponent's boards and clearing the way so she can safely swing in with her gigantic stat block and one-shot our opponents with her commander damage. Currently this deck is valued at 6511, not counting the price of basic lands or shipping. This price was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, we can consider swapping out Austere Command for Storm of Souls, if we'd rather have another mass reanimation spell to help us build up our board with rather than the means to disrupt our opponent's boards, or replace Impassioned Orator with Leon and Elder if we'd rather have a less reliable but potentially more powerful source of repeatable life gain that procs whenever anyone has an artifact ETB. Then for upgrades, we can trade out Patch Up for Return to the Ranks, which works very nicely as another mass reanimation spell that can get back our entire creature base from the bin outside of Luris. Tithe Drinker can be exchanged for Authority of the Consoles, whose life gain procs more often than its predecessors as our opponents get their creatures into play, while it simultaneously slows down our opponents by having those creatures come into play tapped and Banalish Sleeper can be benched in favor of Karlov of the Ghost Council, who serves as a more life gain focused source of removal that we can also just use as a gigantic beat stick to swing in with alongside our commander. And lastly, we can replace Austere Command with Meat Hook Massacre, which still serves as a board wipe, but also doubles as another source of life gain for us and life drain for our opponents as creatures die off fitting quite nicely into this build, provided we, appropriately, are willing to pay an arm and a leg for its inclusion. 
Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Firstly, before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the channel subscribers for having helped the channel reach both its 16.7k and 16.8k subscriber milestones. It's thanks to all of your continued support that this channel keeps growing, so sincerely, thank you. Now, with Amalia covered, our upcoming commander builds will be featuring the Descend-focused Fungus, the Myco Tyrant, followed by last week's poll winner, the hand-attacking Bat God, Aklazot's Deepest Betrayal. So look forward to those two builds coming soon. Then, regarding the usual polls, with the commander deck previews for murders at Karlov Manor starting on January 24th, I'll be putting the polls on hold for the time being so we can jump straight into builds for the new set without having to worry about a backlog to tackle after we're done with the precon upgrades. So instead, stay tuned for the precon upgrade guides for the murders at Karlov Manor commander decks, and then all new polls featuring commanders from that set coming at the tail end of January. And lastly, before we close out, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel can't continue to grow without your support. And if you're feeling particularly generous, feel free to keep me caffeinated via buying me a coffee at the link in the description, or alternatively, use our Game Nerds affiliate link in the description if you're looking to purchase sealed MTG product, accessories, board games, or any of their other wide selection of products at low prices that include free shipping for orders over over $75, and a rewards program that builds up store credit over time as you make your purchases. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.